CO2 control is not going to be sufficient alone? Not, definitely not in the short term because, because of the long lifetime of CO2, the warming that it's occurring in the atmosphere due to CO2 is going, even if we eliminated all emissions today of CO2, anthropogenic emissions, you're not going to see the feedback on the global climate system for many years to decades to come. You'll see mm -hmm. it a little bit incrementally, but it takes about, if you controlled all the CO2 emissions today compared to all the black carbon emissions, it would, and there's a lot more CO2 emitted, it would take at least 10 years before CO2 effects um, outpace the black carbon effects on its climate impact. So it's faster to warm, faster cooling if you control the black carbon compared to the CO2. However, you want to do both simultaneously. Um, as we engage in new negotiations aiming towards the possibility of future international agreements that um, will succeed the Kyoto Protocol, should we be seeking to include black carbon. I strongly feel we should include it because it's a, we know it's a warming agent and it's not, as you mentioned, it's not being controlled internationally, so it'll have dual benefits of health and climate, and I think it should be controlled. I agree with Dr. Jacobson, uh, not just because we want to control all the warming agents, but I think we really want to look at what we're doing when we undertake specific actions. And as Dr. Jacobson has shown, you can decrease carbon dioxide and increase warming if you don't consider the black carbon. So I think we should at least be comprehensive. I think my feeling is pushing the black carbon issue at the same level as the carbon dioxide in the international agreements may be premature for this one small reason. The first definitive study of the CO2 effects on climate was published 40 years ago. And it took us hundreds, if not thousands, of studies before we came to the stage where there is some general consensus. And I, as I, I don't have to remind you, scientists rarely agree on anything. When you get five of us together in a room, you get contrarian opinions. Compared to that, the black carbon issues in its infancy. If you melt all this Arctic ice, and in particular, if you go down to the Antarctic and the West Antarctic ice sheet goes, then uh, you know, you're going to raise the sea level significantly. But in the case of the Arctic, because of the positive feedback, I mean, once you melt that ice, you're, you're warming the surface more and making it harder to cool down. I mean, that, so this is a serious problem with the Arctic. It just makes it, I mean, once you've melted that ice, you, you're, you have all your sunlight warming the surface. So I, I'm really concerned about that. But I also want to point out that you know, CO2, also, black carbon has this, uh, bigger effect on the Arctic than it does kind of on the rest of the world, you know, per unit meter or, whatever, or some kind of unit like that, but so does CO2. I mean, CO2 actually also has a larger effect on the Arctic and over snow and sea ice uh, compared to over land surfaces. Um, so I, I am concerned about the, the tipping point, but also I think you really need to control the CO2 and the black carbon simultaneously because both of them have super linear effects over snowy or, or high, highly reflective surfaces. Mm -hmm. So as, as we look at this global warming problem, if we deal with the, um, uh, the black carbon, we will get a more immediate benefit, maybe delay the tipping point uh, that we're fearful about, and um, give us some a, a additional time to avoid some of the irreversible damage uh, to the planet that uh, has been uh, predicted. Yes, it, it would give additional time, but I guess I wouldn't want that to be translated in, okay, then we don't have to control the CO2, right. which is the concern. So it really just needs to be done simultaneously, right. I think, with CO2 controls. Yeah. It's not really an either-or.